good morning. Let me get all my notes up here. Today is um, June 22nd. Hope you're doing well. Monday. Oh my. Monday morning. What are we going to do? Let me see. Huh? All right, today we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 8, uh, verse number 26. Chapter 8, verse number 26. Um, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, good morning, my brother. Hope you're doing well. Hope you had a good Father's Day. I did. Uh, Janet and I were celebrating two things this weekend. We had uh, her birthday Saturday. So we went down to uh, the lake. We have a huge lake here called Timber, what's it called? No, Smith Mountain Lake. Um, and um, we went and ate for her birthday and then to celebrate Father's Day. So it was a good time. Um, uh, boys covered it. So, uh, it was nice. Um, let's see. Last time we were together, like I said, we finished up, uh, verse, uh, when he was dealing with Simon the sorcerer. And, uh, you remember in 822, he said, but Peter said in him, thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Um, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter for thy heart is not right in the sight of God repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity so I don't believe Simon was truly repentant I don't think his heart was changed if you will um he was trying to commit simony, um, the, the purchasing of an office, specifically the apostolic office. So I don't buy that he was truly converted. And we also mentioned that historically, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, uh, Hippolytus, some attribute either call him a Gnostic, meaning he became a Gnostic, or even attribute the founding of Gnosticism to him. Um, Gnosticism, Gnostic meaning having knowledge, uh, super uh, knowledge, more than superior knowledge, if you will. In other words, very heady, um, which I think, uh, I think some today um, tend to think they have this... Um, the superior knowledge <laughs> that have been enlightened. I, uh, I'm humored when I listen to especially those of the, you know, I, I guess they're guilty on both extremes. The covenant folks, they just kind of think all of a sudden they've learned something new. Um, it's not new. It's been around a long time. That Reformation theology has been around a long time. Uh, but yet they think they've discovered something new. It's kind of like kids in clothes, you know, they wear, um, you know, certain clothes and they act like, you know, mom and dad doesn't know what they're talking about. Uh, just stick it in the closet long enough. It'll come back around. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, I think that pertains to theology too, in many ways. And then, um, you know, on the other side, I think the Pentecostal side, you know, um, they can be guilty of that as well, uh, thinking they have a superior knowledge, you know, because they operate in the spirit, you know, and things like that. I guess we can all be guilty of it if we're not careful. Uh, but, you know, that was the basic premise of Gnosticism. It was very heady. Um, and so Simon may or may not have been the founder, but he was accused of being a Gnostic. Uh, so he actually ended up becoming an enemy of Christianity, uh, not a friend. 
And then answered Simon in, in chapter 8, verse 24, and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Um, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And of course, we talked about who the Samaritans were and what they believed. They were Jewish, um, you know, and how they ended up where they were and believed in what they believed. And then in verse number 26, New Territory, Acts eight twenty six, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south into the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza which is desert. Um, so Philip is now instructed to go down from Jerusalem to, Jerusalem to Gaza. Of course, he is not, the text does not indicate that he was given any justification or that he was given any reason. He was just told to go. Um, in the military, um, we'd always say who, what, when, where, and a good Marine never ask why. Um, you just do what you're told. Um, so, in many ways, you know, in our following the Lord, we don't always know why. We just do what the Lord tells us to do. Um, he doesn't promise to reveal the whys of every situation. Um, I mean, that's walking by faith. You know, it's just like Abraham. You know, sell everything that you have, leave your kindred, and go to a place that I will show you. Which means he didn't show him before he left. Showing him was contingent upon him leaving. Um, so Philip is obedient. You know, he leaves um, and he goes from, from Jerusalem unto Gaza. And verse 27 And he arose and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now, I spent quite a bit of time on this verse in my study the other day because um, many times we read this verse and we immediately assume that this man is an Ethiopian, um, but not necessarily. Uh, just from the text, it appears that he was a Jew. Um, if not a Jew, he was certainly a prosel proselyte. Uh, because he was going to Jerusalem for to worship. So he was already uh, in Judaism, whether as a, um, a biological Jew or a proselytized Jew. Um, I think, personally, and again, I'm speculating, that he was probably a Jew. Uh, and he was going to Jerusalem for one of the mandatory feasts, um, probably Passover. Um, he was just working for Candace, uh, the queen of the Ethiopians, just like Daniel, a Jew, was working for King Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, uh, just like Joseph was working for Pharaoh of Egypt. I mean, after all, I mean, who better to take care of your money than a Jew? Um, uh, they are famous for their abilities to handle money. Um, I mean, God has just blessed them that way. Um, notice that he was, it says eunuch. So immediately my mind says, well, he was a eunuch like Daniel. And of course, if you look at you know, what a eunuch were, what were, they were men that were placed in authority that placed them around women. Uh, so to protect, um, that relationship, they were made eunuchs. Um, however, the word, if you study it, could also mean that he was just a man of authority. He was an officer. He was a counselor of the state. So I don't think we can just run and say, well, he was, he was like Daniel and that he was, you know, castrated. And, um, it, it could just mean that he was a man, man of authority. He was counselor of the state. He was, um, he was an officer, if you would. Um, then also the name Candace, I, you know, for years, I just thought her name was Candace. <laughs> you know, um, Candace, you know, the queen of Ethiopia. Um, but 
the name Candace does not denote a proper name, um, but a position. Uh, just as there were pharaohs in Egypt, there were Candaces who ruled from the city of Mero, M-E-R-O-E, the capital of Cush, uh, which is now known as the Sudan. So there was a whole line of Candaces. Uh, the name itself simply refers to a female monarch. Uh, it can also refer to a queen mother. Um, so it's not, that was not her proper name. Her name was not Candace. She was a Candace. And historically, I went to a website and studied the Candaces of Mero. Um, ancient.eu, if you want to check that out. Uh, ancient.eu, the Candaces of Mero. Um, so again, just cause it says eunuch doesn't mean that he was like Daniel in that way. And Candace is not a proper name. She was a female ruler. Um, and then notice, uh, in verse 28, he was returning and sitting in his chariot and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. So he was obviously within earshot. And said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept a man should guide me? Um, it's obvious from the passage that he was reading from Isaiah 53, um, which speaks of the Jewish Messiah. Um, and we'll see that in the next verses. He actually quotes from Isaiah 53, verses 7, 7 and 8. Um, but I find it amazing how God purposefully or purposely knew that this unit was going to need someone to help him uh, understand the text. Um, and God placed Philip exactly where he needed to be when he needed to be there. Um, that's another reason I believe that we need to be students of scripture, um, so that we can be there for those who are curious, those who have questions. Um, you know, second Timothy four, two says, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reproving, rebuking, exhorting with all long suffering and doctrine. So we need to know the word of God and it's sad. It's, I mean, it's, um, so much ignorance in the body of Christ today. People simply do not know their Bibles. Um, how can we defend? I mean, how can we speak when we don't know whereof we speak? Um, you know, we need to know the word of God. Number one for ourselves. I tell young people, it's not enough to know what you believe because most of us believe what we believe because someone told us that's what we needed to believe. Uh, especially young minds. I mean, they're, they're, they're so shaped by authority figures. Why do you believe that? Well, that's, that's what I was told. That's what the professor told me. Uh, that's what my, my parents, at some point, it's going to have to become your faith, not their faith. At some point, you're going to have to not only believe it, but you're going to have to know why you believe it. You're going to need to be able to point to Scripture. And if you can't point to point to Scripture, you know, uh, then you're into preference now. <laughs> um, we need to know what we believe, and we need to know why we believe it. And then look at verse 30, 31, B. And he answered Philip that he would come up and set with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. So he's quoting Isaiah 53, 7 through 8. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened on his mouth. And in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet? this of himself or some other men man so the guy was curious i mean he had just come back from jerusalem 
Uh, he had obviously heard about Jesus. He had obviously, I mean, his fame, I'm sure, went abroad. Um, and he wanted to know. Maybe he was toying. Was that the man? Was that, was he the one that fulfilled this? Or maybe he was just reading that portion of Scripture and was curious who it was talking about. We don't know. But I would assume if he was a religious man that was going back and forth from Jerusalem, he was very aware of who Jesus was and who he claimed to be and who people said he was. Um, so he wanted to know, what's the interpretation of the verses? Uh, he certainly seemed to have his suspicions. Uh, I wonder how many in the church today could answer this question if it was posed to them. Who was Jesus? I mean, I've been in small towns in Mexico and Guatemala and walked in and said, do you know Jesus? And they tell me, yeah, Jesus lives, you know, down the street, you know. I mean, they don't know who Jesus Christ is. Um, can we explain it to them? Most Americans don't know who Jesus Christ was. They've heard of him. They've heard about him, but they don't know him. Most Christians was it, you know, I'm shocked that I actually stand in churches and sometimes I just do it for shock value alone and say emphatically that Jesus was God. And you'd be surprised at how many people kind of blink a few times and, you know, we just do not teach the doctrine of God. We do not teach the deity of Christ direct anymore in our churches. We allude to things. Um... We don't teach doctrine in our churches anymore at all. Some of the best messages that I preach, even when I go travel, is doctrine. You know, the doctrine of soteriology, the doctrine of bibliology. Um, tremendous amounts of ignorance in, in this regard. And, you know, you can blame the preachers, but you can also blame the people. They simply are not interested they, they don't care. They do not have an appetite for the things of God. I mean, we, like no generation before, can just turn on a computer and find out anything we want to. And, and they have absolutely zero appetite to study the Word of God. Um, they can quote crazy stuff that has no relevance whatsoever but they just do not have an appetite to study the Word of God. Every Bible study that I have ever started, and I'm serious, and I've started a lot of them, uh, you know, it'll start out with, with, with a group, and then it'll spike, you know, and all of a sudden, um, we've got, you know, this, this huge group, man, and then it starts to decline. Why? Because they lose the appetite for it. Uh, they, you know, it's, it's no longer convenient. Uh, they don't want to think. They want. They don't want to be challenged. They, they, you know, uh, they want to hear your their opinion coming out of your mouth. And as soon as they no longer hear their opinion coming out of your mouth, um, they lose interest. Um, and it's sad. So you always end up with that few, that remnant, <laughs> you know, that really do uh, want to know. Uh, but they are in the minority. And I would suggest to you that probably makes up most churches in America. Um, they're just not, they're not, um, they're not inquisitive. Um, they don't want to be challenged. Um, they don't want to be preached at. Um, they're going to call you dogmatic. Um, you know, I mean, it's just, it's sad, you know. So um, they just uh, don't have an appetite for the Word of God. Um, I love it, man. I, I love to listen to one thing. And, you know, I know I listen to guys that I can tell as he's starting the message, he and I are not on the same sheet of music. Because I can, he starts pulling scriptures out of the Gospels. He starts pulling this to build his case. And I know where he's going, you know. But still, I, I, I'm a learner. I want to know where he's going. And more importantly, I want to know why he's going that way. Um, until I can figure out why he's going that way. Um, you know, and again, I may not agree with him. Now, if he's preaching heresy, that's a different story. Um, but uh, there's legitimate good men that have disagreements. And I've found, and I'll close with this, as I have 
started to rightly divide, um, I'm in the minority. Um, because right division um, is definitely in the minority. Uh, but that doesn't mean I write off other brothers and sisters in Christ just because we have a disagreement in regards to that. Uh, whether you believe the church started in Acts 2 or Acts 8 or Acts 9 or Acts 13 or Acts 28, um, that doesn't make you a heretic. It just means we have a disagreement as to where it actually started. Now, it does affect our doctrine, no doubt. It's going to affect the way you interpret the rest of the Bible. It's going to affect, um, you know, where you land on the Hebrew epistles. It's going to affect how you see the book of Revelation, the book of Hebrews, the book of James. Yeah, I mean, it has consequences. Um, but I, I'm still inquisitive. I want to know. Uh, I'm listening to um, Michael, what's his name again, Pierce? Um, Michael Pearl. I'm listening to him. You know, and already I, I see things that, you know, no, I, I don't, I probably don't go that way. But hey, you know what? That guy's been around a while. He's got a gray beard. You know, I want to hear what he thinks and I want to know why he thinks it. You know, because it may alter what I've always believed. Um, Randy White talks about questioning the assumptions. And we assume too much in the church. We just assume it because that's what we were taught. So, anyway, just my thoughts for the day. Uh, let's see, we got down to uh, verse 34. So tomorrow, um, we'll keep going. God bless you, man. Hope you have a great day. Remember, God loves you. Wants the best for you. Working all things out for your good. God bless you.